Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks especially for coming on a beautiful summer evening. Um, my name is Matt. I run uh, product and engineering here, so uh, I'm the guy to blame if you don't like our stuff. Um, but, but I like our stuff. Uh, I think a lot of people do. So I just wanted to take a few minutes at the start to talk a little bit about where we are, what we've been doing uh, recently, and give you some context for where I see things going um, over the next few months. So let's start with 1.3. There's a ton of new stuff that we released um, over the last couple months. Uh, new native mobile containers, so you can do robust hot code push into um, iOS and Android devices into the App Store. Uh, we've started adding a lot of tunable uh, performance um, configuration for live data so that you can um, improve the performance of particular workloads. Lots of updates across the stack, uh, lots of pull requests and, and issues that have been filed by the community. Um, I looked this morning, something like 72.8% uh, of uh, active meteor development is now happening on 1.3. something. So the uptake has been really quick. We're really excited to see that. And I definitely recommend, um, for those of you who haven't made the update yet, uh, the uh, process is fairly smooth. We've got a guide with the, the changes that you'll need to make. Those are thankfully quite short. And then a set of things that we encourage you to do, like moving to modules. That'll be important going forward because we're going to start basing more and more of what we do on the latest ideas in Meteor 1.3. So um, I encourage you to, to keep up to date on those things. There's three really queen features in 1.3, just to review this quickly, uh, modules, NPM, and testing. And I draw them like this because uh, for me, they all revolve around each other. So modules, of course, is about creating a better application structure, about being able to have independent pieces of code with your views, with your logic, with your models um, that live in isolation that you can develop. Can you pick up the mic? I'm sure oh, I do need to pick up the mic, I'm told. I'll just hold it like this. Um, we've, we've been live streaming this for a few years now, and uh, it, it's really cool. You know, we have a room full of people, but then um, you know, we'll have hundreds of people all around the world. And I think one of the cool things about Meteor, uh, just to go totally off track for a second, is uh, just how global the whole thing's been. When we released 1.0, we had a, a bunch of events around the world on the same day. Um, I think it was something like 120 something cities that all had a meetup that same night to celebrate what they'd been building in Meteor. So um, I apologize for those of you watching live or who are going to watch the recording, because this is as important to us as uh, people who can come to San Francisco and, and be with us in person in the office. Um, so with that, back to, to 1.3, modules, testing, and NPM. So, you know, modules are all about organizing your code. Um, it also, along the way, solves one of the biggest irritations of, of early versions of Meteor in load order, so that you can now control precisely uh, which parts of your code get loaded and, and how those dependencies relate. It also cracks open the door for uh, testing. So for the first time, we have a really nice and structured way of doing both individual unit tests of, of modules that run in isolation, um, as well as integration tests that bring in uh, larger parts of the Meteor framework that you can run uh, from the command line. And of course, modules mean we can now start to walk away from some of the wrapper packages that we used to use, uh, both that we published and that were in Atmosphere, in favor of directly bringing those uh, upstream packages in from NPM. And so we've started down the path. We've talked about this a lot over the last few months of the transition to NPM and the ability to draw from that large ecosystem of both client and server packages um, that live inside NPM. So this stuff's great. Um, why this? Why did we build these things and what does it mean for, for 1.4? And for me, it's really about three things. What we're doing is for professional developers, it's for big applications, and it's for technical alignment with the JavaScript ecosystem. That's the theme. And um, look, that's a shift for us from some of the earlier releases that we did and, and some of the ideas we had in, in Meteor 1 and, and, and uh, you know before that. I get it. Um, it's a big shift for a lot of you as well. So here's how I look at it. It's, I think, um, clearly more lines of code. In some cases, you know, if I think about the view layer and the transition from Blaze to React, um, I love React. I, I think in many ways this is the right way to think about designing your components. But it's not perfect, and there's some things that we had with 
um, the way Meteor used uh, Blaze uh, templates that are just a little bit clunkier with React, and that, that's fine. Um, but I just want to talk for a minute about we're going to go in that direction. This is the direction we're headed, and I, um, I think about how like the early versions of Meteor uh, had just these incredible things, this live updating across multiple devices and, and this idea that you could write a query in your client that would reactively draw in data declaratively uh, rather than having to plumb all that yourself. And as those ideas have gained traction in the larger JavaScript ecosystem, and I like to think that all of us are part of that, um, I think it's vital that we stay aligned with that. I think it's vital that uh, a, a developer who's learned those technologies, who's learned JavaScript, and then wants an application development platform um, to find that what's in Meteor resonates with them and resonates and is idiomatic with those technologies that they've learned. So even in cases where it doesn't maybe line up perfectly with um, our original take on how an idea should, should appear in the platform, I think in the long run, uh, we're all going to find that there's a much richer set of ideas and technologies that we can draw on as we embrace those ideas from the ecosystem and, and uh, include them in the platform. And you're going to see both directions there. So we're also going to be bringing more of our ideas to mainstream JavaScript, uh, to NPM, and to the language itself. Um, everything you see from us, for example, from here on out, will be published in NPM. Um, and even beyond that, uh, we are starting to look at technologies. And I, I threw up a, a screenshot of Reify, which is one of the technologies that's in Meteor 1.3.3 uh, that we're bringing to the language itself. So this is. Uh, part of what we've developed that allows you to use ECMAScript modules, which we think is the right way to build an app and, and really the, the best thing in the language, um, to Node. And so this is an a NPM library that you can use. So as with all of what we're doing now, it's published into NPM first, but now part of the Meteor platform and uh, something that we'll be uh, presenting to the standards body uh, for the JavaScript language next month. Uh, ben Newman, our technical lead on Meteor, is uh, bringing this idea um, implemented by Reify to uh, talk about different ways to import modules and have that be more of a runtime decision. So I just throw that out as an example of we're going to be pushing more and more of this technology into the JavaScript ecosystem and to NPM um, as much as we'll be pulling in ideas uh, from that ecosystem into Meteor. So what's in Meteor 1.4? Um, there's, there's two that come first that we've been talking about for a while. We've got an RC out. I'm very excited about um, both of these. So of course, the first is Node version 4. Um, the key thing here isn't updating the version of Node. That's no big deal. The key thing has been um, ensuring that binary packages, uh, particularly on all the platforms we support, so including Windows work very well, even as some of these um, ABIs have changed in Node, and even as that means having to rebuild packages for the different version of Node. So we've cleared, um, cleared through the issues that come up in that. Node 4 will be the standard version of Node going forward in Meteor. Uh, we'll also take a close look at Node.6. It's too early right now, but as that stabilizes and as the key packages in the JavaScript ecosystem work well on Node 6, you can expect an update. Um, to that. And of course, Mongo 3.2. So people have been running against Mongo 3.2 in production for some time, but our recommendation um, was not yet up to that point. Again, there's a lot of detail here um, around developing the app as much as running it into production. I'm delighted to say that a lot of this work uh, came through the community. Um, we're very excited about now being able to push the button um, as Mongo has and now officially recommends Mongo 3.2. And so we'll be doing that um, in Meteor 1.4. But for me, the biggest thing is uh, a change in how we think of Meteor releases. So up until now, uh, a Meteor release has included the core packages, right? Blaze, Tracker, Live Data, the, the things that are sitting at the heart of Meteor accounts as um, particular pinned versions. So if you were running Meteor 1.3.3, we knew exactly which version of each of those packages that you were using. And that works well in some sense because it gives us the ability to talk about a stable release that's been release engineered and that has a consistent set of versions across anyone using it. But it has proven to be 
um, incompatible with our vision of moving more and more of these technologies into NPM and having more of the development behind these technologies happen um, in a more distributed way, in a decentralized way. And so our shift is to de-emphasize this idea of a core package with a pinned version, and instead we'll have a release that comes with an initial set of those packages, but you'll be able to update those independently. So you can, for example, pull in an update of Blaze into a Meteor 1.4 app, not the version that came with it, but something that perhaps came from a community fork or from an updated version that didn't require a full Meteor release. And likewise for the other core packages. It's a subtle change in some ways. It doesn't change the way you use media or how you develop an app, but more than any other, we think this is the thing that unlocks a lot of the transition in NPM and a lot of the ability for more and more Meteor platform development to happen um, all across the ecosystem rather than be centralized in, uh, in our team here in San Francisco and, and uh, um, the, the MDG core developers. Okay, what about after that? So let's talk about some hypotheticals now. I probably should have put some, some maybes and some question marks on this slide. Um, we have not locked down our exact plans beyond 1.4, uh, but we do have some ideas, and I wanted to share um, kind of the, the focus of what we're thinking. So I look at Meteor as three things. If you think about the app platform as a whole, uh, you've got framework, data, and runtime. So the framework are all of the things that uh, we draw in from the ecosystem that um, explain how you're going to structure your app, where the code goes, how your components get built, all these different NPM packages and so on. Um, essentially, what's on your screen and the, the business logic behind that, if you want to think of it that way. And uh, there's been some incredible innovation there. That's where so much of what's happened in JavaScript, I think, over the last few years has really focused. So, of course, Angular and React is view layers the form libraries and the other things that have been built on top of that stuff. Um, and likewise with the packages in, um, in Atmosphere that sit on top of Blaze and, and other framework technology in, in Meteor. And on the other end of the, the diagram is the runtime. So this is Galaxy. So the, the ability to run that application in the cloud, um, zero config in a reliable way, in a way where your web sockets are routed to the right place and there's a consistent way of, of managing that. Um, and that's, uh, I think, been something that um, completes the picture for Meteor development because it's no good to write the app if you can't run it. And uh, we've, I think, viewed this always as a whole solution. So you should be able to, in just one command, deploy that app into the cloud, and particularly with WebSockets in the unique way that you want to run a WebSocket-based app, um, have a really nice turnkey experience. So in between those two, is what I think in many ways has been the, the most interesting feature in Meteor from the very beginning, which is the data layer. Um, the ability to declare a query on the client, have that data flow into the client automatically based on the contents of your Mongo database, and have that data as it changes in the database, um, not have to juggle all the mechanics of how to re-query or pull in more data when the state of your screen changes or you bring a new component onto the screen but rather have all of that happen declaratively uh, based on the, the queries you wrote and the, um, the state of your client. So we started down a path um, early this year of asking, what does the next version of that data layer look like? Uh, we asked that question because, of course, people want to use not just Mongo, but other databases with Meteor, SQL, uh, REST endpoints that provide data, um, other kinds of databases, of course but also because we, we saw that there was an opportunity to bring that data layer to um, developers that weren't using the other two parts of that platform. So for example, developers that were using a native mobile application instead of a, a JavaScript-based client, or developers that were running their application in a different setting where they didn't have a stateful connection to the server. So we are really excited about Apollo's progress over the last few months, and it's time to start talking about what it's going to look like to bring that into the Meteor platform. So let me just kind of describe for you quickly what, what we think of Apollo is doing. And if I, if I explain Apollo, um, what I tend to do is talk about this, this big problem that app developers face, whether you're using Meteor or something else, where we're now finding that we want more and more clients. 
with more and more components, more and more features, and therefore more and more data that needs to get pulled into those clients. And we're finding on the server side that that data is coming from more and more places. So you know, in the old days, you might have a single database with a single endpoint that provided all your data via API. But today, some of that data is coming from third-party endpoints. Uh, developers are moving to microservices where you've got multiple backends. We've, we've seen meter developers building more and more of this over time. And the problem is you end up with this mess of connections. Every client or every component needs to understand every one of those data sources, how to fetch data from it, what the schema for that data might be, what the mechanics are for executing a change to some of that data. And the solution as we see it is a layer that sits in between the two that organizes all that data and centralizes it into a unified way that applications consume, can consume it. So that's the, the role of, a, of an Apollo data layer in an application today. Um, we've based ours on GraphQL, which is a query language developed at Facebook for declarative data fetching. I think many of you have seen some of the uh, talks that we've given on Apollo. Um, I don't want to go through the technical details of it, but just to show you the concept is much like what we used to have in um, live data, you write a query, and we have a, a, an example GraphQL query here on the left, and then you get back results from the server that match the fields you asked for. So the language is different from the query language you used in MiniMongo, but the concept is very similar in some ways. It's a simple, intuitive, declarative way of representing the data that your client needs, a component in your client needs, and then pulling that into the client. And um, Apollo comes in two parts. So we have an Apollo client, which is the part that you load onto your um, uh, JavaScript client, or as I said, your native mobile client. And this is responsible for a lot of what, in older versions of Meteor, the combination of MiniMongo and Tracker and live data was responsible for. This is the part that lets you write a query, this time in the GraphQL syntax, load that query over the trans transport over the wire, cache it in your client so that as um, components want to do optimistic UI, you have a place to store those temporary changes, and so that as you switch between states of your app, um, you don't have to consistently refetch data from the server each time you change states. So that should all sound familiar um, from the way that we've always used live data in Meteor. Um, but on the server, things are a little bit different because the Apollo server, um, unlike uh, Meteor live data, isn't tightly bound to Mongo. So on the Apollo server, uh, what we do is we have a, a way of connecting to various data sources, whether they're REST endpoints, SQL databases, Mongo databases, whatever it may be. And the job of the server is akin in some ways to what the live data server half of the Meteor stack would do. So it knows how to resolve a particular GraphQL query by drawing data from those different places. Um, what's neat, though, is that by basing this stuff on GraphQL and other standard technologies, we can start to take advantage of a lot of common tooling. So I think one common complaint with um, live data in Meteor is that it's sometimes hard to understand what the system is doing. It's hard to inspect what's going on. And I'm very happy to say that even this early in the Apollo effort, um, that situation is a lot clearer. We can use, for example, uh, the Redux dev tools to inspect the exact state of the client as you subscribe to data, as you make changes, um, all, all inside your browser, all in a very nice and, and, and simple way of development that's idiomatic for a React developer. Um, but let me talk just a minute about, in particular, what it means to start bringing in Apollo uh, for a Meteor user. So of course, the big thing is you're going to be able to query data from SQL, from REST, from MongoDB. Uh, that was the original impetus behind the Apollo effort, and uh, um, uh, it's very natural to do. There's no more fundamental connection to Mongo um, on Apollo. It's more modular. So in Apollo, your queries live with your components. In live data, the model is more that you have a subscription or a set of subscriptions for your app. And a lot of the complexity in building a large Meteor client has to do with juggling those subscriptions based on what route you're looking at, which things are on the screen. Now it's much simpler. The, the components on the screen determine the data that they require. That data loads independently, so you have isolated development of each of these different components. Um, and we've got scalability. So uh, reactivity in Apollo is going to be optional rather than mandatory. In fact, the early versions don't yet support reactivity. That will come. Um, but it will always come as an option so that in cases where you'd prefer a faster, lower load um, system, 
that's a, an option for you. And we have a number of people we've been working with where the workloads actually uh, fit very nicely with this. And as you dial back some of the reactivity, what you get in Exchange is more predictable performance, right? So you have more of a, a classic web workload where you have a number of clients and you can therefore predict exactly what load um, that will put on your servers, something that, again, has been challenging uh, for some of our larger live data users. So here's how I see this going in 1.5. We start with this stack. So Meteor apps, of course, are centered around DDP. And what we'll do is an incremental transition where DDP and Apollo can sit side by side um, in your application. This is a primary design starting point for us. And we're already doing this. You're going to hear uh, from Rohit in just a little bit about how we are currently using Apollo and DDP side by side in Galaxy's uh, management console. Um, New Spring Church, one of our early development partners, um, gave a talk here about how they've been using Apollo in their Meteor apps to draw data not just from Mongo but from REST endpoints um, as well as MySQL. So we're committed to a, a path where you'll be able to use these different pieces um, together as we figure out the right time for a transition for Apollo to be the new default data layer. So one, one final note, um, we've seen a lot more contributors, as I mentioned, uh, to Meteor and to the Apollo stack, and we're orienting a lot of our work around those contributors and around the ideas that you're bringing. I mentioned Mongo 3.2 being something that came from the community. Uh, Blaze now has a, a repository where there's room for some development um, outside of the, the sort of MDG-centric workflow that we, we used to know and love. Um, Apollo has dozens of contributors already, including uh, New Spring Church and others that are using it in production. So what I want to say is that we prioritize um, the work that's uh, coming from the community. We prioritize the pull requests and the changes and the ideas um, over uh, sort of first party things that, that we're going to drive. So um, to make that work, we're going to cut releases more frequently. I think you've seen that uh, both in terms of the media release cadence, but also the cadence of publishing individual NPM packages for Apollo, for Reify, uh, for all the other technologies that we're building. That's a big change for us. Um, and we do it because that allows us to have a much faster feedback loop where a great idea comes in as a PR. We can tighten it up. We can put it into a release and push it out the door for everyone. So um, if you see something, say something. Send us your PRs. Uh, my commitment to you is that's the thing that goes to the top of our, our priority list. Um, and we're committed to making that together into uh, a platform for all of us in the future. So thank you. I know I ran long. Do we have time for a question or two? OK. Happy to take a question or two if anyone has one. Yeah. Mm. That's a great question. Um, the question is, should, will we do an LTS? Like, is there going to be a media release that, that has some kind of long-term commitment to it? We've talked about that. I think it's a really interesting idea. Uh, <coughs> we weren't willing to do it until we were on Node 4, right? So uh, that was uh, one of the reasons we wanted to push for that. Uh, we also have a, a commercial developer subscription. So we have companies using Meteor in their products that um, uh, look to us for guidance around migrating from version to version um, for changes like that. So I don't know if it'll be a formal LTS, but I will say uh, part of why we built the platform this way is that there should be, if what's important to you is stability rather than racing ahead at the speed of React, right? Um, that ought to be something you can get from Meteor. Uh, that's to say... We're not going to needlessly break APIs. We'll backport bug fixes to older releases. We've done a lot of that, but I'd say on, on more of an ad hoc basis, and I think it's definitely interesting to think about what it would look like to put a more formal stamp on that. Alex. Is 
Mm. So the, the, I'll try to summarize your question. You, you very nicely laid out there's a trade-off between um, having a stricter release model where everything's been QA'd together and um, the model where, because we've unpinned these packages now, it's a little bit more amorphous. And so uh, there are many more combinations of packages out there. Um, and it, it's something we're asking ourselves. What we found was, I think it's essential to have more options around individual package versions if we're serious about the move to NPM and about community contributions to some of these things. It just doesn't work, for example, if the community contributions block on a major media release. And, and because of the QA burden to do that, that only happens every few months. But you raise a really important point that uh, one of the benefits of Meteor has always been this idea of a stable um, set of releases. So I think there's some technical solutions, like you mentioned um, the constraint solvers as one possible one to maybe limit the total number of combinations or, or have a little bit more assurance that the combinations make sense. Um, I think there's also some social solutions around organizing a lot of these releases of the key packages so you may see us doing some work or the community doing some work um, around uh, maybe a, a healthy compromise between um, the every six month pace of, of media releases a year ago and the every three hours and sometimes I'll just delete my packages pace of NPM, right? Um, I think there's an answer in there, but to be frank, we're gonna have to find it together. Yeah, yeah Michelle. Ah, what's it mean for a REST data source to be reactive? Excellent question. Uh, I could pontificate on this for a long time. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a really practical answer and I'll give you like a crazy answer. The practical answer is it's not so crazy to pull REST endpoints in many cases, uh, particularly if you cache the results or if the endpoints are simple um, and efficient. Uh, and so for a client to want live updates of what's coming from a REST endpoint, in many cases, it's actually a pretty reasonable thing to do. And something Apollo could do for you, and I don't want to put a promise on like how quickly we'd get to this or what it would look like, but certainly it could make sense to make that a property of the data fabric, right? So that you, you don't have to write code in your app for that. The, the crazy outlandish answer is something like, REST is totally wrong for that. Um, what you may see over time is a move toward um, other architectures. You may see, for example, more and more data sources out there where they really do want to be reactive, where they're live updating, um, have more of a push character. Uh, you may find like an architecture where uh, data providers push messages on a bus actually fits very nicely in that. Um, and I know some people in the microservice world are going in that direction just because you can build highly robust systems if rather than doing blocking RPCs to get data from another piece of the system, each piece of the system is responsible for pushing data into everything else that needs it. And therefore, if it falls apart, um, the errors are more contained, right? It doesn't take down other parts of the system. So uh, maybe, maybe the best answer is just, there's a lot of interesting ideas here as we expand beyond Mongo to other sources of data um, for how we can adopt a lot of the ideas in Meteor that were so important, like reactivity, um, into the architectures that we're seeing in these larger existing applications. So the question is, uh, meter's getting harder. Um, I'm a student, I loved how easy it was. Uh, am I worried that it's getting harder to learn and, and how do we think about how that fits into things like education? Yeah, I worry about that a lot. I mean, we, we started this whole effort because programming in my mind is too hard. Too few people know how to do it. It's a really powerful skill to have. Um, the world would be a better place if more people, more diverse set of people had that capability. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, I think there, as I said, I think it's vital that um, 
to be successful, to be something that everybody can learn, it's got to be um, based on standards. And a lot of what made media really easy in the earliest days was possible because there weren't any standards to worry about. We could do whatever we wanted, right? That just isn't the case anymore. And, and for me, part of this is um, the real prize is finding an answer that meets the constraints of actual software development in the actual world with the desire to bring a great developer experience to that. I think there's a lot of room for that. You know, I talk about data and, and I probably presented it more in a sort of cold way than I needed to, but this stuff is way harder than it needs to be. And a big story with Apollo is there's been great progress on making other parts of the application development effort easier and easier, but a lot of them are constrained by how hard it is to move data around, how hard it is to fetch data. That's the, that's the long pole in the, in the, in the, um, in the picture right now. So we're not losing sight of that for a minute. You will definitely find examples where you had to type a little bit more or read a little bit more. And Lord knows we could do more to improve our documentation. I think the ecosystem as a whole could do more of that. Um, uh, and, and we're not about to lose sight of that effort. Yeah. Okay. I think that's all the time. Thank you. And, uh, enjoy your summer. <laughs>